This is looking, um, Look Past Labels, Lessons from Working with Youth Who Experience Homelessness and Sexual Violence. That's a mouthful. We used a very large title just to help individuals realize what we're working with today, but by no means do we like the title. Um, completely, and we'll talk more about that as we carry on this webinar. So thank you again. And as we move forward, first I'd like to introduce Taylor, and I'll let her introduce herself. Hi, everyone. Uh, this is Taylor Teichman. I'm the Special Projects Assistant here at the National Sexual Violence Resource Center. Um, I'm really excited to be joining you all for today's webinar as um, this is something that I am very passionate about um, and am continuing to learn as well. Um, and I'm excited to be doing this presentation with Eric today. Um, Nicole, I see your question. Um, there's just audio today. There will be no video just to respond to your question. And um, my name is Eric Stiles. I'm the Rural Project Specialist here at NSVRC. And this is a subject matter that's really near and dear to my heart, and especially with a lot of the work that I do across the country and working with LGBT youth. Um, and we're just so humbled to have so many individuals here joining us today. Um, the record, um, this webinar will be recorded for a later usage, um, so you can come back and actually um, see this webinar in the future. It will be linked to our website. And first off, we want to thank OVW. Um, this is the grant. This is funded under, under the Rural Grant. And my little joke is always saying, thank you, OVW, and if anything goes wrong, blame them. No, they are wonderful for doing this work, and we're so happy for them to be very supportive of this uh, very important work. So as we get started, the content of this webinar may be upsetting, um, especially those who have experienced violence in your own life. Um, and we ask you to take care of yourself and to do what you need to to take care of yourself. That might mean um, taking a breather, walking away from your computer for a minute. This will be recorded so you can always come back to it. With that in mind, there's also another way that webinars like this can be somewhat problematic, and that is you get triggered because you feel like you've done something wrong in the past. This is not about shaming. This is not about you've done something wrong. This is about learning new tools and new ways of doing our jobs better. So as we create a learning experience together, just keep that in mind um, that we're not here to say anything you've done in the past is wrong. We're saying here's some ideas for the future and hopefully collectively we'll push this forward and do um, really good work together. So first off, we have a poll, and I'm going to set this poll up. So let's see if this works. You should be able to see the poll on the left. And if you're able to see the poll on the left, uh, we thought we would just start with um, a little activity for everyone. Um, and what the question for this is, what is the average age at which you first leave home? So we're just wondering if you could respond with either answers to A, B, or C, depending on um, which you believe is the average age at which, at which youth first leave home. And A is, uh, answer A is 12.4 to 13.9 years old, B, which is 13 and a half to 14 and a half years old, or C, 15.4 uh, to 13.9 years old. Looks like we're getting lots of B for 13 and a half to 14 and a half years old. Okay, and it, so it looks like the majority are going with uh, choice B. And actually, the answer you are now muted is A. So the average age at which youth 
do first leave home is actually 12.4 to 13.9 years old. Um, so again, we just thought uh, this would be a, a good activity to kind of uh, to, to set the framework uh, for our discussion today. And um, again, you can hit star six and that will mute your phone. Um, as we move forward, uh, there's some grounding concepts we as advocates, uh, whatever field we come from, can all agree upon. And we're going to cover those right now. Um, one is we believe the survivor. Um, two is we do no harm. Three is we listen to the survivor and take direction from them. It's their own path. Four is we center ourselves in the work that we do and we take care of ourselves so we can be present and take care of the needs of the survivor. Five is we understand that we come from an inherent culture, whether it be our work culture or the culture we were raised in or live in, and that others come from different cultures and we respect their cultures. And six is we do not exclude any survivor um, as being unworthy of our services. And seven is we're non-judgmental. And this is different than being aloof. And it's different than tolerating somebody. And we'll talk about tolerating someone later. But being non-judgmental is very important to the work that we do, especially with youth who are struggling with these different um, intersections of sexual violence and identity. So I know it was a quick rundown. And when you go online to pull up this PowerPoint slide, we'll have that information also attached. And it's really great to ground yourself in those concepts and really have conversations within your organization when you start working more with these youth about this. So the first concept is around identity. Everyone in this room right now, all of us, have multiple identities. Um, I love this image because there's like multiple identities happening on here. Um, how we see ourselves, how others see us, there's age. Um, but today we're going to talk about how four different identities intersect with each other. And that is being from a, coming from a rural area, struggling with shelter and housing and being homeless. Three is being what's qualified as youth. And four is having sexual violence affect your life. So those are four different identities. Now, as you've noticed or are probably thinking yourself, these identities can also be forced on a person and they might not be self-identified. The reason we didn't put sexual um, identity on this or sexual orientation is because that's something we're going to be getting into. But those four identities, how they intersect now throwing on sexual orientation. So I'll let Taylor take over now. Thanks. So we kind of wanted to just recognize and honor the fact that um, defining what rural means um, and how that doesn't necessarily fit into one box. Uh, there are, are, of course, many different components which make every rural community unique and different. And so again, we just kind of wanted to recognize and honor that in this space as we are talking about um, rural youth who are experiencing homelessness and sexual violence. Um, I love from the Start Toolkit actually, there is kind of a great, um, a great definition you could say of uh, what is rural in that um, the toolkit mentions and suggests that rurality exists more as a state of mind and an attitude than as an actual area on a map or um, number of persons per square mile. So again, again, kind of looking at rural as, you know, it's unique to each community um, and it can be based on many different combinations of things um, that aren't necessarily just uh, with geography and population, but again, can also include um, cultural dynamics, um, and of course, um, how your rural community um, exists with um, within employment and income, um, and again, just uh, many different unique combinations of that. And especially with our youth that we're talking about with this group, ruralness 
can be defined for them as being isolated and isolated from others like yourself. And I want everyone to try and kind of keep that in the back of their head. I know often with our grants, we are under the structure of a number of people per county, but thinking through what it means to be rural also incorporates what's it mean to feel like you're the only one and you're isolated for these youth. So kind of as um, another framework to our discussion today, we kind of wanted to um, touch on rural homelessness overall for a moment um, and really kind of look at how poverty can be um, a result of homelessness along with a lack of affordable housing. Um, and this poverty and lack of affordable housing can happen for many different reasons. Um, including uh, lack of job opportunities, lower incomes, um, possibly needing to have multiple jobs in order to make ends meet, um, there being high unemployment rates, um, just to name a few. And uh, we wanted to share as well that um, some research from 2005 shows that the odds of being poor are between 1.2 to 2.3 times higher for people in rural areas than um, areas that are not uh, considered rural, and that is um, research from the National Coalition for the Homeless. So we also wanted to share with you, um, this is a, the, the Homeless Youth and Sexual Violence infograph that uh, here at the National Sexual Violence Resource Center um, we have been working to create, um, and we promise it will be made available very shortly, um, but we kind of wanted to give everyone uh, a little bit of a sneak peek as to what uh, this, looks, this looks like. Um, and we really wanted to, uh, our goal of this infographic was to really show those intersections between youth who are experiencing homelessness and who are also experiencing sexual violence um, because of that homelessness that they may be experiencing or um, sexual violence even prior to uh, the homelessness that they experience. Um, and youth uh, may become homeless, um, again, because of uh, poverty in, in rural communities that we kind of just touched based on a little bit. Um, youth can experience this poverty with their families. Um, because of that lack of money, um, lack of support, um, it could also come a, from a um, lack of education. Um, and for youth who experience homelessness, this can also lead to unsafe um, conditions leading to sexual violence as one of those unsafe conditions that they are experiencing. Um, so this infographic really, we're hoping, shows that connection between the two. Um, a lot of times with unsafe conditions that youth are experiencing, um, this tends to make them vulnerable to sexual exploitation and sexual victimizations as they do not have the basic safety and protections that housing does normally provide. Um, because in, in rural communities where poverty is happening, um, this can cause frequent moves through different housing systems for youth and their families. Um, and we, we wanted to also be able to share that the National Alliance to End Homelessness uh, estimates right now that during a year there are, are approximately 550,000 unaccompanied single youth and young adults, um, which they consider up to age 24, who experience a homelessness episode of longer than one week. Um, and then approximately 380,000 of those youth are under the age of 18, which uh, we do have depicted there at the top of the infograph. And then um, to kind of point out as well, as we move through the rest of our conversation this, this afternoon, um, to just kind of take note there that then with that number, that one in five of those youth are identifying as LGBTQ. And, and often this infograph, if I were to look at it and think of the key points, the key points that I take away from this is that rural homeless LGBTQ youth 
actually move from the rural area to the cities at a higher rate, that they experience it at a higher rate, the homelessness, and that they also experience violence at a higher rate. And I always have to take numbers and put them in just plain English, and that's how I look at this so that it makes sense to me. So if you're not a numbers person, that's something that can be helpful, just looking at for that, those reasons. We will be coming out with a whole guide as well, and we're looking forward to that probably at the end of October. We're hoping it will be published, and that will be online. So everybody who's taken part in this webinar, we'll be sending links out to that information as well. And then moving forward a little bit to look at um, intimate partner violence, um, kind of in correlation with the infographic we, we just had up for you, um, and in mentioning that uh, youth can experience homelessness um, and sexual violence and victimization through those unsafe conditions because of not having that, those basic housing needs met, um, there can also be some family and relationship um, experiences that may also um, cause youth to experience this homelessness. Um, and those family and relationship uh, issues can be seen um, with neglect or rejection, uh, conflicts that may arise between parents uh, or different family members. Um, youth might be experiencing substance abuse within their home uh, along with sexual violence uh, and or physical violence um, from family members as well and um, which can lead um, many to leave home by, by either choice or uh, by force um, from those family members or parents. Um, and we kind of wanted to share too since um, the most recent NISFIS report came out, um, the National Prevalence Study um, shows that 23% of female victims and 14% of male victims are um, first experiencing con uh, contact sexual violence, physical violence, or stalking by an intimate partner before um, the age of 18. And also to just kind of put in perspective too, as Eric uh, was just speaking um, about uh, youth who identify as LGBTQ that 40% of LGBTQ youth um, are running away from home because of um, being forced to leave their home. So this gets us into uh, a few things and I'm going to start off with LGBTQH. Um, the reason we have this, these letters up there, and often I hear individuals refer to it as the alphabet soup of letters. It, it means sexual orientation and gender identity expression, as well as health status. So I'm just going to run down them really quick. Um, the L is for lesbian and a person who identifies as having strong affectional attraction to another woman. Now, affectional attraction simply means who you want to grow old with who you want to spend your time with, who makes you most happy. Gay stands for a male who wants to spend most of their time with another male in a romantic relationship and grow old with. Um, bisexual refers to an individual who can either have that relationship with someone who identifies as male or female. Now those are very binary, describing someone as being male or female. And this is where transgender community comes into play and that means it's a gender identity. It's an expression of who you would identify with. On the inside, I might identify as being more female, so my gender identity could be female. Um, all of these are self-identified. The Q can go into questioning or queer. When I was growing up, I'm 40 years old, queer was not a term you threw around the playground. It was a term that was meant to insult somebody and hurt them. But youth nowadays are using that term to reclaim it. And it means basically they don't want to fit in any box. The T can also be used for those of two-spirit or twin-spirit or third generation in our tribal communities, and there's many other terms. But all of those terms are self-identified. And they're only important when someone tells, them, tells you that's what they identify as. H 
stands for someone who's living with HIV. That's a mouthful. I have to take a breath after that. So what we're talking about with these youth who are really struggling in a lot of different areas is that their environment has been taken from them. Often youth are kicked out of their homes. A recent Huffington Post article, which we'll send the link out as well with this information two weeks ago, showed a young man in the South who came forward and told his father and his stepmother that he was gay. The response was extremely horrible, belligerent, and he was kicked out of his home. That young male now is collecting the money that's sent to him and giving it to a homeless shelter for LGBT youth because he knows what it's like to struggle and be kicked out. So it's these lived experiences that really cause trauma to the youth, and they're cumulative. They add on each other. There's microaggressions that happen at home and microaggressions that happen at school and other in situations. Um, some of those um, other situations that happen with the actual microaggressions are how when they go to church, for example, they actually hear um, being told that they are worthless, that they, their worth is just um, nothing. So we have to think about that. So when someone comes in, this little bubble here of homelessness, I mean, homeless, LGBT, rural youth, there are all these bubbles around the person's self-identity. It's how they identify and how they interact with those that's really, really important. And these interactions look very, very different. Often what we find is that caregivers, in their best ways of being advocates, separate ourselves on lines of these bubbles. So we have advocates who work with those who are homeless. We have advocates who work with those from their youth. We have advocates that work with those from LGBT communities. We have advocates that work with those that are rural. Sexual violence, we have advocates. If you start putting all these together and everybody's separate, we cut the person in parts, in fragments, and they're already living that experience. I cannot impress upon you enough that that becomes problematic for actually working with an individual holistically as a whole human being that changes dynamically from meeting to meeting, day to day, moment to moment with what their needs are, desires are, and dreams are. So as we move forward, keep that in mind. Um, the lived experiences that an individual goes through and that migration process. I'm going to tell a short story of a youth I worked with in a rural setting in Pennsylvania. Um, when I started working with him, he came in because he was in a foster care system. He was kicked out of his family of origin because he identified as being gay male. Um, taken into a foster care system. In the foster care system, he was also sexually assaulted, um, at which point he ended up running away um, we had made a contact actually in that time period where he came in and saw me for services. Um, our agency provides some very good support, uh, which really blessed him to have a contact point. He ended up moving to a larger city and uh, we lost contact, but he'd call in every once in a while. He was couch surfing. Um, he fell under the radar. No one noticed that he was homeless or not going to school. So this youth finally came back into the area, came back in, and we started talking more. And we asked him at one point before he ended up leaving our services because he actually finished high school, graduated, and was going to college. Mind you, he lived on the streets for a while in Florida. We asked him, what brought you back? He said, you're the first place that ever asked me if I was hungry when I came in. You were the first place that offered me a place to sleep or take a nap because we had a safe room. And we were the one place that we didn't treat him like he was dirty, even though he knew he was physically dirty because he couldn't wash his clothes and he couldn't get a shower. So what that tells me and what the evidence tells me from our guide and the work that we're doing is that taking those moments that we have as advocates and really looking at a person for their lived experiences without judgment and taking those into account differently than we're normally programmed to as sexual assault advocates can be very beneficial 
to the prognosis and the healing and the journey or however you want to word that for the individual you're seeing. So as we move forward with more lived experiences, the important thing to take into account is some of these lived experiences are invisible. I did mention that that young man was couch surfing. It made him invisible because when people asked him if he had a place to stay, yes. The couch surfing means he just kind of bunked up at a house in this one larger city, and there was a good 17, 18 other youth that were staying there with a very, very much older male who was taking advantage of them sexually. He never, the youth that I worked with, qualified it as such, but me as an advocate go, he's being preyed upon. Um, he looked at it as, my lived experience is I must perform sexually for this person so I have a place to stay. So he looked at a survival sex. I couldn't come in there and say, you're being raped. I had to go with his lived experiences, listen to him where he was at, and ask him what his needs are. This goes off to Taylor. Yeah, and that, um, thank you for sharing that story, Eric. That's a really great uh, transition, actually, into the next portion of our discussion that we'd like to have with you all. Um, we'd like to take uh, the, the last portion of, of what looks like about a half hour that we have left um, to really kind of look at the, the three um, components that you can see at the moment, um, which includes, so the first thing we, we'd like You are now muted. Um, Anti-oppression framework um, and how we can incorporate trauma-informed services with an anti-oppression framework. Um, and then moving forward to also discuss some trauma-informed services in regards to collaborating, um, which can include uh, collaborating with other community partners um, or partners in your um, outlining counties as well. And then we would like to just kind of end the day then talking a little bit about commitment um, and establishing commitment um, to the youth in your community, um, to your services, and again, uh, with your community partners as well. And so anti-oppression, um, we throw this word around a lot, an anti-oppression framework. Um, we're going to give a very quick idea, and the, the easiest way we could look at this was this badge. It says, hello, my name is. Anti-oppression framework means we meet an individual where they're at, but they're not their label. That the words underneath this were words that, you know, we've heard individuals be called, um, especially around the orientation, um, you're not your label. We want to know what your name is. We want to work with you from where you're at, and we understand that we have privilege. By the mere fact that we have a job, we have a home to go to, we have privilege when we're working with somebody who's struggling with housing. We have a privilege by our age in that a lot of things are designed in our country to be designed for that of an older person. Uh, we can vote, we can drive, we can drink. Uh, we have privilege. So really understanding that we come at it with a lot of privilege, even though we might not feel we do. So the best way to do that is to start looking at a person as an individual. Um, sounds very basic, but some of the most basic things in advocacy skills we sometimes overlook because of the label scare us. I know that a label of someone coming in who's had no place to live, who doesn't have food, and who's struggling and pregnant, I am fearful for that person. I get trapped in my head of going, how can I help this person who's pregnant? Not going, how can I help this person named Taylor, for example? Where can, where can I be an advocate for Taylor? I look at the labels instead of the person. And so we kind of wanted to open up um, in the chat box area now. We kind of wanted to um, ask all of you, um, keeping in mind this anti-oppression framework um, in regards to establishing some trauma-informed services, um, how does the space you create foster safety for these youth to take part in your services? So if uh, folks would like to share some ways that uh, you are creating um, space 
that is trauma-informed, keeping in mind also this anti-oppression framework and doing that. We would love to hear uh, some, of, some of the ways in which you're doing that in your communities right now. So we'll kind of give folks a few minutes to, 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 share, to share some of their spaces with us. So as we give individuals a chance to um, type in the chat box, um, some things that were important in creating, uh, fostering a safe space. Oh, I see some coming already. Posters that show all races, uh, levels of youth, so in other words, ages. Uh, we have a very open space with teens and young adult materials on hand. We never blame the victim and we try to let them talk on their own. Right. That's and great. I love what Meg is sharing, that they have books and magazines in their waiting room um, for people of different genders and ages. Having water, we learned in our waiting room, having snacks, um, and actually asking the community for assistance with that really um, worked out well because we had some um, individuals in the community that provide those things. Um, it looks like we have some more. Uh, gender neutral language and don't assume the patient's gender and gender of their partners. Thanks, Di. And I know, Eric, you had touched on this a little bit when you were sharing your story about how you had a, um, a, a self-care room or a safe space in your agency. Um, I know that having that space in order for, the, for that youth or those individuals to just kind of have that, have that space where they can um, feel safe and comfortable and kind of um, expressing themselves if you have arts and crafts in that room um, or even again like the books and magazines in that room, um, pen and paper yeah. for journaling, um, having a, a space like that can also kind of help foster that, that safety and, and youth knowing that um, by coming to your, your agency, they know that they have a space that they can go to. Um, for those moments when they, they need to be able to feel safe and, and express themselves in their individuality. Yes, and that's really, and we had survivors help create that. Lauren mentioned um, basic needs are number one, linguist needs, um, treating people with dignity, Cheyenne says, definitely important and respect. And Charlotte says, having someone with similar orientation to talk to. So seeing representation. Those are all really good ideas. And as we move forward, keep brainstorming. And I encourage others to kind of take some notes on these. And we will definitely send out some notes afterwards with some of the notes around what are some ways that we can create those spaces. Um, because as we move into collaboration, um, we've touched upon um, the idea of our services, what we can provide. Our normal centers provide hotline, maybe helpline, one-on-one, -on -one, medical advocacy, legal advocacy, maybe some group work, um, maybe some holistic kind of services. Usually those are the services we provide. However, these youth may need services around CYS, children youth services or foster care systems. They might need advocacy around housing. They might need advocacy around how to get food, how to get um, legal documents, how to get IDs, how to finish school, how to apply for college. Um, they may need referrals for civil litigation because of the structure of their family. Um, and you start getting bigger and bigger with the amount of services these youths need. Early on, we mentioned how they, that gets separated into these different segments. We get siloed. There's the people who work with housing and homelessness. 
having a collaboration with those agencies and getting some MOUs and partnerships in place is very important to how we can provide services. Because we know that we can't provide every service. However, if we make strategic partners, we can get those services met for the youth. A very important of making those collaborations is how we debrief. Um, meaning advocates, we have this large skill of understanding how to debrief after we meet with a survivor of sexual violence. You talk with another agency that maybe isn't that familiar with sexual violence as an agency and doesn't have many trainings on it, we have an important role to step in to help advocate for the needs of a sexual violence survivor, and we have the role of debriefing with those other partners to help them talk to us because a survivor doesn't just close off their life between agencies. If they go to some place, a shelter perhaps, where they feel comfortable and they are talking about their lived experiences, sexual violence will come up. That advocate in the shelter that might be a homeless shelter might not have any training on that. So we as advocates of sexual violence can help them debrief, um, we can help train their agencies. And those are very, very important skills for us to move forward. It means us moving into other systems that we don't normally work with. We've worked with very limited. Um, and it often means we're creating spaces at the table. Part of that collaboration, I would encourage you to get youth on your board. Because a youth member on your board can help your agency shape and grow and change. This is not unheard of. Many agencies, whether they be medical or advocacy, do have youth on board. And tomorrow in Scotland, 16-year-olds are voting for the right to separate from England. So if a 16-year-old can vote on a country, <laughs> they should be able to be on your board and tell the board and express what the needs are. So again, we're interested in hearing from all of you um, in the chat box. Uh, we would. We're curious to know what other um, organizations and other partnerships um, you have in your community that you already have collaborations with, or um, you can certainly share with us too if there are some partnerships that um, you are working towards creating that collaboration with. And again, we'll give folks a few moments to be able to share share those partnerships with us. Because again, we need, uh, as we mentioned earlier, with every rural community being unique to um, it, its own community, we'd love to hear what partnerships you have. District Attorney's Office and Housing, to name a few Meg mentioned. And those are very, very important. Um, and as housing rules changed with VAWA, our importance placed with serving sexual violence is actually um, sexual violence survivors' needs with housing is becoming increased. So creating those collab collaborations is important. Um, DV centers, Juvie, and COCs um, from Cheyenne stated. And um, Avento Liaison from Marty, McKinney Vento Liaison, that's I believe a homeless shelter in the area. And Juvie Centers and RTFs, I just want to bring that up, residential treatment facilities. They are nice words for child prison. Um, residential treatment facilities, a child is usually locked down um, in many parts of this, uh, our country. So youth do not look at those as good options. And we are told as advocates often by people in the partnerships that they are good options. Um, lots of violence takes place in those facilities. Transitional housing is some private homes, Charla said. Um, Laura said disaster chaplains. While people are talking really fast now, and I really appreciate that. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot. I mean, this list grows and grows. I haven't seen any sort of religious groups. We know religious groups are very important for collaborations because they often provide a lot of support. And not all religions hate LGBT individuals, putting that out there. And also libraries. There's actually a national campaign. We're going to get into that too. Yeah. Um, which actually 
uh, kind of leads into just talking about commitment a little bit. Um, and having commitment in, with the youth in your community, having that commitment to your community, and then having that commitment by establishing um, partnerships with other organizations within your community uh, to better serve um, these youth. Um, we recognize that that commitment um, doesn't happen overnight and that it takes years to build that commitment. Um, it takes months and years to build those commitments um, and that those commitments need to be reaffirmed um, as, as you continue to build upon those relationships with um, the other organizations that you're partnering with in your community. Um, and of course, building the trusting and relationships with the youth that are then coming through your doors that you're serving, um, being able to provide them with that trusting and, and safe relationship um, will certainly um, represent that commitment that you have um, for this work in your community. Um, and we also recognize too that um, just because um, a service works one time, um, it doesn't necessarily mean that that same service can work for another individual, and that's okay. Um, that's part of uh, listening to each uh, youth lived experiences because, of course, we're all different. Um, and as all being different individuals, we all have different lived experiences. So again, just kind of going back to that commitment of listening to the youth um, that you are seeing um, and, and building um, your services and your capacity to meet their needs based on, on what, they are, what they are sharing with you um, and telling you each time that they come back to see you um, certainly builds upon that commitment too. Yes. When we're talking about commitment, it's commitment to have these conversations, commitment to have them within our organizations. We know that not everyone has the um, power within organizations by having these questions. So the, the next critical question is kind of based on that. What type of critical questions can you take back to your organization for serving needs of these youth? Now, at this webinar, we are giving the link to the trauma-informed care um, document, which will be very helpful to you. And like I said, in October, we're coming out with the linking the guide, actually, the, what this is based on. So you will actually link in the ROSE guide. So you will have both those materials to actually formulate those questions, and you have Taylor and myself to help you stratify that and figure out what's the best option for your organization. And Sharla, I just want to say thank you so much for saying orientation should never be an issue for offering help to you. Um, however, we know realistically not every agency does that, um, and that's why we're talking about it. Um, we actually have found that a lot of agencies' orientation does hinder the ability to provide services. Often this takes place in gender identity. If you have a male individual there who's above a certain age and you're in a dual center, then that person might not be able to receive services there because of their policies they have in place. So does anybody have any thoughts on like maybe a question to go back and ask your agency? And a good, good example of that would be what is our policy on providing food to someone who has no food? And we also were very aware that this last question was going to be the most kind of sticking point. So we were going to end on this one. And it's food for thought. And here's where we get to hear questions you have for us. Oh, why is the policy for gender identity people staying in the shelter? Um, wonderful question, Sharla. So some shelters do have a policy 
in our country where they view that they can provide the same service for a male outside that shelter and it's too much of a triggering event for women in the shelter is their view. So they have an arbitrary age. I've seen it everywhere from 13 to 17 where the youth is asked to leave or being a different place. And it often keeps people out of the shelter. Um, so it is a reality in some places. So just being aware of what your shelter in your area might have. You're hoping to hear a little bit more about barriers to seeking care with the homelessness to avoid sexual violence and repeat violent attacks. Nicole, so what you're asking for here is about one of the best ways we know about intervening in secondary attacks for sexual violence for these youth is first off making these solid foundations for them to have a touchstone, some place they can really open up and talk to or have multiple places. The more resourcing they get, the more ability they have to make different decisions. They don't have a sense of hopelessness or indifference to those decisions and those choices. So if they feel like they can feed themselves, they can have shelter, and they have someone safe to talk to, that gives them enough resources to actually make different decisions. But when you don't have the ability to take care of yourself or feed yourself, those decisions really put you in a vulnerable spot to being attacked. And please, I would really encourage you to have a more in-depth conversation with us, and we're going to give our contact information. Lauren, you have um, curious about resources of the LGBTQ community here in support groups. Lauren, please email me. I have all that information. You have a wealth of knowledge because we live right next door to each other, um, so we can actually get that um, for you and just via email. Um, Nicole, where would be the best place to obtain stats in the array of homelessness, homeless who experience sexual assault? So we have some of those stats we can report to you. However, they're not the most current. Um, what we know is it's more likely to experience sexual violence while you are homeless. Um, but, we, but the stats are not um, that current. So we didn't put those up, but we can definitely give you more of that. Um, what were the four identities mentioned at the very beginning, Caitlin says? Um, we used homeless, uh, rural, youth, and, oh, my mind went blank. I'm so sorry. Rural, homeless, youth, and sexual violence. Um, Youth go into survival mode, they function enough to stay alive. Charlotte, that is a wonderful, wonderful way of putting it. You summed it, you summed it up very well there. And I think you're speaking to um, the idea of what youth lived experiences are. That survival mode of how do I get through to the next moment. Often, I know that in my experience of working with youth, um, I've also done outreach, actually going and working with young gay men or identified as sex workers, and they would say that I do what I do to get through to next to tomorrow. I can't think a year from now. I might not be here. And in that process, that 24 hours for them is so much work to think through. Where are they going to sleep? Where is the food going to be? How am I going to numb the pain? If they're using a drug, where are they going to get that drug from? Um, if they have to navigate not getting caught by police and prosecuted. So that 24 hours for them is comparable to us trying to plan out the next year of our life. And they do that on a repeated basis, daily, 365 days a year. So thinking that through and how much energy is spent by that youth, it's quite remarkable how resourceful they are and how much they can really accomplish. We just need to help them out. Uh, we're drawing close to the end. I hope this is a good conversation starter for you, you and getting your agencies involved more. The guide will be coming out, like I said, late October. It could be linking the roads. We'll be sending an email to everybody with that contact information when it does come out. Here are some of the resources we pulled upon for this webinar, um, the references. And then as we move forward, before I say thank you, here's my contact information. 
and Taylor's, you'll be receiving a PowerPoint copy, is I just want to say thank you from the bottom of my heart as an advocate who's worked with you. Um, I really, really feel that the 63 people who are in this room are wonderful for the work that you're doing. And it takes a lot of hard work on our part, and our hearts hurt a lot. So take care of yourselves. And we're here to be your resources. And we're here to find you other resources. So please do not feel like you can't reach out to us. Please reach out to us. And if there's no more questions, I'll let Taylor say a closing. <laughs> but thank you again. Yeah, and again, I just kind of want to echo Eric's words. Um, thank you all for joining us today. Um, this is something that is very, very near and dear to my heart as well. And um, again, just kind of leaving knowing too that, you know, it's, it's all um, a learning process. Um, we're allowed to make mistakes. So it's okay to make those mistakes, um, ask questions, and continue, continue learning. Um, that's, you know, that's how we continue to learn, and that's how we continue to better serve um, this, this community and these youth. So thank you all so much. Um, uh, you will get certificates. We can send something out to you um, for your personnel files. Just please um, make sure you send us an email and resources page again. Yes, I can show that again, Kelly. Uh, we'll you'll be sending this out today to you, so you'll be getting this re all this uh, copy right after this. Have a good day, everybody. Bye. Bye.